Good morning, church. Isn't it great to see the, uh, the next generation up here, you know, playing? It's absolutely fantastic. Well, what a week it has been, a week of prayer and fasting. You know what? I'd like to say that you're all looking a wee bit smaller as a result. Now, I used to work with a bloke uh, many years ago who worked in the South Island on the ambulances, and he would tell this fantastic story. I'm not going to mention any names, so everyone will remain nameless. But he tells a story of an old man who went outside and saw that his cat had died. And he was, of course, quite troubled by this, so he went back inside and he said to his wife, Look, dear, I've just found our cat's died. And she says, well, you better go outside and bury it. So out he goes, finds a shovel, and starts digging. But he doesn't get very far. He develops chest pain. And he starts feeling terrible, so he goes inside and he says to his wife, I'm sorry, dear, I'm feeling terrible. I've got this chest pain. Call an ambulance. And at that, his heart stops and he collapses. So my colleague, he's sent to this job, and he arrives and he finds the, the elderly man on the ground and starts to uh, uh, provide resuscitation. And after about 20 minutes, half an hour, he realises... He's not responding as we would hoped. So there was a decision made to stop resuscitation. Now, in these circumstances, we tend to ask family, hey, look, what would you like us to do? Because, you know, it's actually a really, really horrible time, and usually family are in a state of shock. They don't know what to do. So you never know exactly what family member is going to say. And in this case, it was very unexpected. So the elderly woman said, you know what, there is something you can do. So you can guess this, can't you? <laughs> to my husband, he was out bearing the cat when he, he came in, then he, then he, then he passed away. Do you mind going and burying the cat? <laughs> now, being a good paramedic, he, he thinks, well, that's taken me by surprise. Okay, I'll go up there and do it. So out he goes, out the back door, finds the shovel and locates the hole. He takes off his, his thing and he starts. Dig, dig. What he didn't realise was that this woman was really quick on the phone and she called a lot of her relatives who lived very close by and said, do you know what, my husband, he's passed away. They came around very quickly. Imagine their surprise as they walked into the house <laughs> and looked out the back window to see a paramedic digging a hole. Now, they had no idea that the cat had died. They just saw a paramedic out the back digging a hole. One of the family members was so enraged, he came out and he punched him. Now, of course, I don't condone that sort of violence at all, but you can see for both parties, it was unexpected. That's a good question. How do we deal or cope with the unexpected? But before we go any further, let's pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for this time and for the opportunity to delve into your word. May this word be a message in season in accordance with your will. Amen. So the title of this sermon is... Preparing for the unexpected, bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. Isn't my wife clever? Look at that. So 
So what we're going to do today is trace our way through a few passages in Luke. We'll start in Luke 3. So those with your Bibles, turn to Luke 3. And those who don't have your Bibles, grab your phone out and pretend you've got a Bible app on your phone. You know, from a glance, Facebook Messenger does look like a Bible app. All right. Luke 3. Now, this was a time of oppression. The Jewish people were expecting a Messiah to come and conquer their Roman oppressors. The people were expecting God to show up and save them. We just read about uh, uh, the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus Christ. And we come to this bit here. So at this time of oppression, there was great expectation. But instead, something unexpected happened. God sends a crazy person from the desert. A man with a very odd fashion sense who ate locusts of all things. And why did God send him to prepare the way for the Lord? As we see here, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth and all people will see God's salvation. Now this prophet, John the Baptist, had no patience for the religious leaders of the time, which were the Pharisees, as we see in the next verse. In verse 7, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, of which the Pharisees were a main part, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Look at what he called them. Vipers earmarked for destruction. Well, that's a bit harsh, isn't it? Maybe turn it down a wee bit, John. No. These were the ones that people looked up to as examples, as holy men. John is doing something very important here. In fact, a couple of things. The stranger from the desert points to the very elites from which the Messiah was hoped to come and says, no, they are not up to speed. People look elsewhere. In fact, watch out for these people. But he's quite kind in a way. He gives them some helpful advice. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. There it is. There is the solution to your problem, O oh holy men. Repent and show some evidence of it. So let's just stand back and see what's happening here. God, through John the Baptist, is challenging the people's very understanding of what righteousness looks like. The Pharisees, no. They've got work to do. In fact, beware of them. But what did he mean when he said bear fruit in keeping with repentance? Well, we're going to take a look at that because when we do, we will see some very interesting parallels with the temptation of Jesus and the anointing of Jesus by a sinful woman in the chapters that follow. Let's look at the first example of how to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And that is in Luke 10 to 11. So, the crowd say, what should we then do? John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. So what's he saying here? Is he simply telling people how to manage their clothing and food? No. 
He's talking about something a lot deeper. He's talking about the very thing which drives us to keep food and clothing for ourselves instead of giving it to others. He's pointing to our sinful flesh. That part of us that wants to hoard and conquer and get what we can and as much of it as possible. We all suffer from it. The second practical example John the Baptist gives is in the following verse. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Look at his response. Don't collect any more than you are required to. So he tells the the tax collectors to collect no more than they've been ordered to. Now, of course, he's not saying don't collect taxes, but instead don't go beyond that which you were ordered to collect. So this is more than just a simple warning not to rip people off. He's saying, don't be a law unto yourselves. Don't be lone agents. Don't go beyond the limits sent by the one who sent you. Set by the one who sent you. The, the third example. In the next verse, then some soldiers came to him and said, what should we do? He replied, don't exhort, extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. That's Luke 3.14. So to the soldiers, he says, don't use people or your power in a way that benefits you. Don't manipulate others. Don't use people instrumentally to get what you want. You should be content with what you have, your wages. We're all guilty of doing that. Maybe we're not soldiers, but I'm sure we've all manipulated people at one point in time to make sure that our will wins out. So the author Luke has been pretty helpful here. He didn't have to include these practical examples at all. They could have happened and we would have not known anything about it. But he decided that it was important Why? Well, for a number of reasons. But I think one of them is because it relates very nicely to the temptation of Jesus' narrative and what happened to the sinful woman. Let's continue. Are you all with me? Good. Okay. Turn to chapter 4. People with phones. The temptation of Jesus. Now, Jesus had been baptized by John in the Jordan and was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days where he was tempted by the devil. Let's read. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Notice there, coming through the water into the wilderness. Sounds a bit familiar with regards to the uh, Israelites, doesn't it? Leaving Egypt. Where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man should not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem, and then had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. and They will lift up their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. 
when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until a more opportune time. You would have thought being in the desert, 40 days without food, was a pretty opportune time, right? Anyway. So let's look at that first example of temptation. Satan is asking Jesus to satisfy the desires of the flesh. The hunger in itself is not a bad thing. Don't get me wrong, but it is an, it is an example of a desire that can become problematic. Je what was Jesus' response? His response was to deny the flesh because there is a better way. The account of, of, in Matthew of the same event says it this way, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We're not to live lives that are focused on what the flesh desires, but rather on the word of God. Remember the first example that John the Baptist gave to living a repentant life? Don't succumb to the desires of the flesh by hoarding wealth when other people may need what you have. See, there's a link there. There's another interesting parallel with the second temptation. Satan offers Jesus an opportunity to abandon God the Father and live on his own terms with all the dominion and power that he was shown. But what was his response? You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Here, he acknowledges the one who sent him. Recall what John the Baptist said to the tax collectors. Don't collect more than you're permitted to. You know, there's an authority that you are subject to. Jesus gives a wonderful, perfect example. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He acknowledges the one who sent him. Just like John the Baptist was asking the tax collectors when they would collect tax. Don't go over and above. You were sent by someone. Keep within the limitations of what you were, you were given. And the last temptation. Satan leads Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and tries to get him to test God. Now Jesus knows exactly what he's doing and tells him very clearly, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Notice that what Satan is trying to do is to, is to get Jesus to do something that really demeans God. Not only is he testing him, He's also using God as some sort of servant, some sort of cosmic butler. God, you said this, you said you would do it, and now I want you to act. I'm going to do this, and I know you're going to do what I would like you to do, which is to save me from falling. How many of us have treated God in this way? How many times have we prayed for God to do something that will benefit us in accordance with our own will. That is why it is so important that when we pray, we ask in accordance with His will, not ours. Do you remember the advice that John gave his soldiers? Not his soldiers, let's correct that. These soldiers. He told them, don't use your power. Don't falsely accuse people. Don't manipulate people to achieve what you want. Be content. Can you see the similarity here with Satan's third temptation? What should we make of all of this? Well, let's put it all together. So John the Baptist, the one sent by God to prepare the people's hearts for Jesus, called people to repent for their actions. The people had set their minds on meeting the most basic desires of the flesh, a desire for money, power, and comfort. They were a law unto themselves, people who saw no problem with manipulating others to get what they want. Sounds like a Pharisee, doesn't it? What was John's advice to the crowd? Don't live this way 
And a few verses later, Luke presents us with a perfect example of how Jesus overcomes the flesh, submits his will to the Father, and refuses to manipulate him. Does this have any relevance to us? Are you or have you had any troubles with the flesh? If you are, set your mind on the things of God. Jesus' hunger must have been unbearable after 40 days, but he knew how to overcome it. If it is not impossible for it is not impossible for us with the help of the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about this in Romans. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. Turn to the person next to you and say, he's stalling for time. But there's one final piece of the puzzle. Let's go to Luke 7, 24. Jesus had just provided John the Baptist's followers with a confirmation that he was, in fact, the Messiah. They came to him saying, hey, look, are you the one that was prophesied about? And Jesus gave those examples. He said, yep, I am. Fantastic. When they left, he questions the crowd. He says, what did you go out to see? Did you go out to the desert? Did you go out to the Jordan to see one of society's elites? No. A prophet. That is what you saw. And he was sent pre to prepare the way for me. Then he says something very interesting immediately after a comment to the Pharisees about the Pharisees. Let's read Luke 7, 31 to 35. Jesus went on to say, To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the pipe for you and, we, and you did not dance. We sang, we sang a dirge and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all of her children. Jesus was never one to miss an opportunity to criticize the Pharisees. And this one is telling. He provides a masterful diagnosis of the Pharisees' spiritual problem. Listen up, Pharisees, and I'm paraphrasing here. That prophet you went out to see, John the Baptist, he had a divine purpose to prepare the way for the Messiah. I've, I've confirmed that I'm the one that he was preparing the way for. But the men of this generation, you Pharisees, you failed to respond as you should have by repenting. You even failed to recognize the one the Father sent. And then almost out of the blue, the author Luke appears to change course. All of a sudden, in the next verse, the scene changes to a situation in a Pharisee's house. Note, if you will, that Luke could have chosen any story, but he decides on this one. Not by accident. This event took place in the Pharisee's house immediately after Jesus' diagnosis of their spiritual blindness. So keep that in mind. Let's read. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating in the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alab alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them and poured perfume on them. 
When the Pharisee who was invited, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, if this man was a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. But she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher. He's, he said, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither, neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them would love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who has the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this man? This woman, sorry. I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love is shown, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, this was a setup. Do you think that is a bit odd that in this instance, a sinful woman who the Pharisee knew had inside knowledge about Jesus' whereabouts? I mean, usually if people knew where Jesus was, a crowd would follow. We see that in all the other narratives. But in this instance, only a sinful woman is mentioned. There may have been others, but only a sinful woman. And who let her in? And who let her stay? But I don't think she was in on it at all. Her actions don't fit with that explanation, quite the opposite. The sinful woman demonstrates the very fruit of repentance that the Pharisees lacked right before their eyes say that again. The sinful woman demonstrated the very fruit of repentance that the Pharisees lacked right before their eyes. You see, John the Baptist highlighted the problem to the Pharisees. You are godless individuals who live for yourself. Jesus provided the solution, how we should live with God. And the sinful woman put it all together. She came to Jesus with that expensive perfume, not hoarding the wealth that she had for herself, acknowledged his authority and demonstrated the sorrow for what she had done. She didn't test him or ask him to do anything. She simply did what she could with a repentant heart. Notice that she didn't say, Lord, Lord, I'm waiting on you to tell me what your will is so I can focus on that. If you could let me, go, let me know, that would just be great. No, there was none of that. She waited. And his response a few verses later stunned the room. Your sins are forgiven. Could musicians come up, thanks? What can we learn from all of this? Well, in the first few chapters of Luke, we can see the essence of the gospel message. When we come to Christ, just like the sinful woman, with a repentant heart that says, sorry, Lord, for living a self-centered, godless life that focuses on meeting my own wants and desires, no matter what the cost to others, we encounter forgiveness. Jesus doesn't push us away. He doesn't put us to shame in front of others. In fact, he advocates for us in front of those who would accuse us. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you know that you need to get right with God. The Holy Spirit has brought you to this very place to meet with Jesus. If that is you, we'd love for you to come up so that we can pray with you. Church, 
Do not underestimate the power of the gospel message. The Holy Spirit is at work day and night bringing people to a place where repentance is possible. It is up to all of us to make sure that we have that message there ready at all times. It is something that we need to be ready for in the season ahead. For those who know Christ, you're running a race. But it isn't a race where we focus on how holy the person next to us is. On the contrary, we must focus straight ahead on the prize that Paul mentions. For those that are running, how is your race going? Are we more interested in how we look as we are running to others rather than how much closer we are to getting to that finish line? Are you, with the help of the Holy Spirit, putting to death the desires of the flesh as a repentant person should? Are you still running towards the finish line set by God or have you deviated towards your own? How do you relate to God? Do we only call upon Him when we need Him? Do we only call upon Him when we want something? You know, He wants and He deserves more than that. God, as we come to you today, we know that you are a God who cares about each and every one of us. You're not a God who is indifferent to our sufferings. In fact, you cared so much that you came down and took on the worst possible suffering on that cross so that those who put their faith in Christ can be set free from the penalty that awaited them. It is in you, Jesus, that we find forgiveness. It is in you that we find life eternal. We praise you, Lord. Amen. For those who don't know Christ and want to know him, please come forward as we sing and we'll pray for you. The front is open for anyone who would like prayer.